Today's experimental mathematics seminar uh, speaker is Noga Alon, formerly uh, from Tel Aviv, but now in Princeton, who will talk about coloring subsets by R hyphen Y's intersecting, intersecting classes. If you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question uh, and then mute yourself back. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Doron, and uh, thank you all for participating. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, whenever you have any question, uh, please uh, don't hesitate to uh, stop me and ask uh, questions. Uh, uh, so I'll be talking about uh, uh, coloring subsets by R-wise intersecting classes. Uh, uh, this will hopefully be clear in a minute. And uh, uh, one reason I like this subject is because its study combines uh, some topological and extremal and probabilistic combinatorics, and it's also related to questions in additive uh, number theory and in information theory and even in functional analysis, but, uh, but just a little bit of, uh, of each of those. And, uh, I'll try to uh, explain it in uh, uh, the uh, next uh, uh, 40 uh, minutes or uh, so. So uh, here is a, a main question that I, I want to, uh, uh, to raise uh, or a conjecture I want to suggest. And, uh, and really the main objective is to uh, mention this uh, question tell you some simple things uh, I know uh, to prove about it and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, try to, uh, uh, to explain uh, uh, why I think it's uh, interesting. Uh, so the question can be formulated in the uh, three lines that you see here. And this is what is the minimum number of colors required to color all K subsets, so subsets of uh, cardinality K, of an n element set so that every color class is r wise intersecting. And I explain here what I mean by r wise intersecting. It just means that every collection of r not necessarily distinct members of the family has a common point, or equivalently, every collection of at most r members of the family has a common point. The at most is just uh, to avoid some triviality where the family has less than R subsets. So if it has less than subsets, we insist that they have a common point. And if it has more, we want that every R have a common point. So in particular, if R equals two, this is just an intersecting family. Every two subsets intersect. And, the, uh, and here is one observation, is that one color suffices, we can color all the uh, K subsets of an N set uh, in one color, namely every R of them are intersecting, even only if K is uh, strictly bigger than R minus one N over R. And this is because in that case, the total size of the any R elements, the sum of sizes of a R a subset is K times R. And by the a pigeonhole principle, it cannot be that each of the elements appears only R minus one times. So this is just a, uh, now I, uh, it's not so important to remember uh, the notation. I uh, mention it uh, again when I, uh, uh, when I uh, talk about it. Uh, and uh, uh, let's see uh, first a construction, a simple construction that gives an upper bound that tells us how many colors uh, definitely suffices. Uh, so let me denote by S the largest integer that is still smaller than RK over R minus one, okay? And then for every I that is not one of the last S elements. So for every, my, uh, my uh, uh, ground set is uh, integers from one up to N. And for any I uh, up to N minus S, let me denote by F sub I, the family of all K subsets in which the minimum is I. So we take all the subsets 
that contain the element one. Of course, this is R wise intersecting. They all contain the same element one. Then we take all the subsets that we didn't take already in which the minimum element is two. And then we take all the subsets in which we didn't, uh, which we didn't take already in which, uh, which contain the element three and so on. And we do it until we are left with S elements. And then we take all the K subsets of these S elements. And because of the choice of S, this will also be R wise intersecting. So the arithmetic is not so important here, but if you uh, work it out, this gives uh, a construction that tells us uh, an upper bound for the number of colors that uh, if we have the ceiling of n minus r over r minus one times k minus one colors, then this suffices. Okay, so there is this construction. So, In Noga, can I ask a quick question? Uh huh, sure. So, can this be formulated on k uniform hypergraph? Is this a statement about coloring? K uniform uh, hypergraphs? Uh, this is true, only uh, it uh, should be R uniform hypergraph. So uh, it is, uh, and we will come to it later, but, but it's true that we can describe some sort of, a, a, of a R uniform hypergraph. And, uh, and what we are talking about is the chromatic number of it, and this will, uh, uh, I, I'll mention it later. Thank you. Good question, and also a, a thanks for showing everybody that uh, you can uh, ask questions whenever you feel uh, like doing it. Okay, so the conjecture is that this is tied for all K, which is at most R minus one K over R. No need to remember the formula here. Anyway, I'm going to use uh, an equivalent uh, uh, formulation. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is uh, the following. So since the upper bound is simple, really the conjecture is about the lower bound. And if we denote by T the number of colors, really the conjecture is equivalent to the following. If N is at least T minus one plus KR over R minus one, then whenever we T color all the K subsets of an N set, so we do it by T colors, then there are, are not necessarily distinct K subsets that all got the same color and they do not share a common point. Okay, so if n is that big, then t colors are not enough. One of the families will necessarily not be uh, R Y C uh, intersecting. And again, no need to uh, remember uh, the precise expression here. I repeat it when I need it. Uh, uh, you can uh, uh, think uh, that uh, really the conjecture says that the construction we saw before is extremal. And let me mention that already for R equals two, so if you look at R equals two, you see that uh, uh, the formula here gives a uh, two times K plus T minus one. And, uh, and then, the statement, which in this case uh, was a conjecture by uh, Martin Knesser, whom you see here in the 50s, and was uh, proved by uh, Lazzi Lovas uh, in the 70s. Uh, so this is uh, really the Knesser conjecture, which says that uh, if we want to partition all the K subsets of an N element set, into intersecting families. So now just pairwise intersecting families, then uh, the minimum number of families we have to use is N minus two K plus two. Or if we use T colors, uh, we cannot do it for N, which is at least T minus one plus two K. And the proof of Lovas was a, a one of the uh, first and arguably the best known application of a topological uh, methods in, uh, uh, in combinatorics. Uh, and, uh, and since then it has been simplified. Uh, so there are uh, uh, several uh, related uh, proof of it. Uh, Imre Baran uh, uh, found uh, the first uh, uh, kind of simpler proof but really the simplest is due to Josh Green, whom you also uh, 
See here, he found it uh, when he was an undergraduate student uh, before he came as a graduate student to a uh, Princeton. But still, uh, so, so his proof is really a, a few, I mean, maybe half a page. Uh, uh, and the only thing is that uh, uh, you have to use the borsal coulomb theorem. And basically all the proofs are topological. They all use the borsal coulomb theorem. So this uh, picture here. So, so this is sitting. There's no elementary proof? Right, yes. Yeah. So let me say there is no elementary proof, uh, despite the fact that there is a paper of Matushek that is, uh, the title is a combinatorial proof of Knesser's conjecture. But really what he's doing is that he's using Tucker's lemma and Tucker's lemma is at the heart of the proof of, uh, of borsal coulomb theorem. He's not really hiding it, he's saying it, but, but it means so you can go into the proof of the borsal coulomb theorem and kind of, uh, but still uh, I think it's completely fair to say that uh, all the proofs uh, use topology. And it's also fair to say that once you decide to use topology, then really the proof can be described in a few lines. So I, I'll not do it, but it's, uh, and the, uh, and the picture here is an illustration of a borsu kula, maybe want, uh, the theorem. Okay, so let me go back to a, to this more general conjecture, the, the Knesser conjecture. Uh, so we want to extend the case R equals two to every R. So we said that the, an equivalent formulation is that if N is at least T minus one plus KR over R minus one, then in any T coloring of all the K subsets of an N set, we can find R K subsets that get the same color and do not share a common point. So this is what we want to prove and, uh, and I still uh, don't really know to prove it for all values of parameters, but I'll, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, uh, what I know. So, uh, uh, so as we said, the case R equals two is fine. This is uh, just, uh, Knesser uh, conjecture or a uh, Lovas uh, theorem. So, uh, so this is a seminar on experimental mathematics and therefore it makes sense to try to experiment with uh, some possible proof approaches. And I want to tell you uh, three possibilities and this is indeed uh, uh, also the order in which I uh, thought about it. So uh, the first attempt will not succeed then the second will be closer to it, and then the third will do something. Okay, so here is a, a, the first or attempt number zero a, uh, to, a, to tackle this conjecture. And, uh, and this is, a, so as I said, a, the case R equals two, basically all the proofs use topology. So it seems natural to try to use topology. And indeed, a, a, one can try to apply tools from equivariant topology in the spirit of, so there is a paper that uh, uh, I really like uh, from the eighties by uh, Imre Baran, Senya uh, Schlossmann and uh, Andras uh, Such, uh, where they prove what they call a topological version of a theorem of Helge, Helge uh, Tverberg, uh, whom you see here. And, uh, uh, and basically you can try to use what they are doing. So they are proving their some extension of the borsal coulomb theorem and show how to use it. And, uh, and in fact, I uh, uh, more or less convinced myself that, uh, that using this, uh, uh, one can uh, prove at least an approximate version of the conjecture and uh, probably also a precise version of the conjecture for some limited set of the parameters. Uh, but this would be, a, 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 I didn't uh, a go through all the details uh, even for myself, but uh, this would be a complicated proof. So you would have to go through the topology. You would have to do quite a lot of things. Uh, definitely not something I would have been able to uh, uh, tell you in uh, 48 minutes or less. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but somehow uh, trying to do it, I realized that uh, I'm kind of reproving uh, a lot of the things that uh, have been done in the known proofs of uh, uh, results about the chromatic number of Knesser hypergraphs. So this is a, a kind of relates to a, uh, the a question that uh, Edina uh, mentioned. Uh, 
And, uh, and this would be a, a, a second attempt or attempt number one is to, to try to reduce it to known results because, uh, uh, because this could be easier and indeed this would uh, uh, give us at least something. Okay, so here is a, a attempt number one. We started to count from zero. Uh, so we try to reduce it to known results about Knesser hypergraphs. Uh, let me define what is a, a Knesser hypergraph that uh, has been considered uh, before. Uh, uh, so it has its R uniform and it has uh, two other parameters, K and A. So this is the R uniform hypergraph whose vertices are all K subsets of the set of the first N elements. And an R tuple of K subsets forms an edge, even only if the subsets are pairwise disjoint. So it's a little bit different than the hypergraph that we really care about here, but they, but this is a hypergraph that has been considered before. And that's kind of the natural hypergraph analog of the Knesser graph. In the, the Knesser graph is the case R equals two here, where the vertices are all K subsets and two are adjacent if they are disjoint. So now the vertices are still all K subsets of an element set and R of them form an edge, even only if all the R are pairwise is shown. So n has to be at least k times r for them. And, uh, and there was a conjecture of Erdes about the chromatic number of that uh, uh, raised in the 70s. And, uh, uh, and this is indeed uh, uh, what we uh, proved with Peter Frankel and Nazi Lovas. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it says uh, the following. Uh, that if n and what is written here is tied, so we really determine the chromatic number of this hypergraph for all values of say a parameters. If n is at least t minus one times r minus one plus k r, and again don't bother to try to remember the exact formulas, but this makes sense because of the natural uh, upper bound. Uh, then the chromatic number of uh, uh, of this uh, uh, Knesser hypergraph k g superscript R with the uh, uh, parameters K and N is bigger than T. And if N is it exactly what is written here, it is uh, the chromatic number is exactly T plus one, and this is tight. Okay. So, uh, so it seems uh, uh, natural to try to reduce what I'm trying to, uh, to prove now to this, and uh, let's try to do it. So here again is a, a theorem, uh, if n is at least, uh, so this is uh, on the top is what uh, we know, right? If n is at least t minus one times k minus one plus k times r, then in any t coloring of all the k subsets of an n set, there are r pairwise disjoint subsets of the same color, okay? And on the other hand, the, the conjecture is that uh, if uh, the conjecture that we are trying to prove now, the if n is at least t minus one plus k r over r minus one, then in any t coloring of all k subsets of n set, there are r subsets of the same color that do not share a common point. So this looks very close. You see that even the notation are the same. Well, of course, deliberately I chose uh, the same uh, letters. And you see that the n that we have on the top is bigger than the n that we have on the bottom just by a factor of r minus one. And, uh, uh, and on the top, we have r pairwise disjoint subsets. Uh, in the bottom, we have r subsets that do not have a common point. So this basically suggests a reduction that we can try to do, and it will almost work, but not uh, quite. So again, here is a conjecture uh, on the top. I, I was just repeating it. And, uh, and here is the attempted proof. So we are given a T coloring of the K subsets of an N set and N is at least T minus one plus KR over R minus one. So what we want to do now is to replace every number I between one and N by R minus one copies of it. So we replace it by a set CI of size R minus one. And then for each K subset, if the K subset 
that I denoted here by F is I1, I2 up to IK. Let me denote by C of F the set of all R minus one to the K, K subsets or transversals that contain exactly one element of each Cij. So we really take a blow up of the coloring we have. We replace every vertex by R minus one copies of itself. And therefore every edge of size, or every set of size K becomes R minus one to the K sets and they all get the same color. Okay. And, the, uh, and now we want to, uh, so we get a T coloring of K subsets of a set of size, uh, T minus one times K minus one plus KR, because we increased it by a factor of R minus one. The caveat here is that we don't get a coloring of all the K subset, but of almost all of them. Uh, I uh, say a little bit more about this uh, later, but still the hope is to use what we know about this Knesser hypergraph and to get our pairwise disjoint subsets of the same color here. And these are pairwise disjoint subsets, if you think about it, they would give us, they would come from our subsets that do not have a common point. Because if they had a common point, then all these subsets after the blow up should have at least one point in the corresponding set CI and because its size is only R minus one, the pigeon hole will tell us the two of them have a common point and they cannot be R wise, pair uh, uh, wise uh, uh, disjoint. Okay, so, so if indeed we could have used uh, this theorem that we knew, then this uh, would give it. And, uh, and even if uh, uh, you didn't follow exactly what I said, this is a uh, very simple and uh, and you can uh, believe me. So, uh, so again, uh, let me ask uh, or let me repeat that if there are any questions at any time. Uh, yeah, I have a quick question. So, yeah. It is a kind of conjecture that you are believe that in 99.99% is true. So it's no point in looking for counter examples for reputation. Uh, right. Yes. I, I, yeah, I definitely 90, yeah, I think I'm 99% say, convinced it is true. Uh, but, but of course, uh, uh, there have been examples in the past uh, where I was wrong, but but I'll try to give uh, enough evidence uh, showing that uh, that, I, that it's very likely to be true. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so it'd be a waste of time to look for counter examples. Well, it's never a waste of time and may, okay. maybe you learn something else, but, uh, but, but I think it's unlikely, but, but sure, I mean, you are, yeah, yeah, maybe. Okay, so, so just uh, um, I wanted to say, what is the trouble with this attempted proof? So I already hinted at it. The trouble is it's a coloring that we get is not a coloring of all the K subsets. What we get are only the subsets that contain exactly or at most one element from each set CI. But there are K subsets also that contain two elements or three elements from the same CI. And these ones, we didn't define a coloring of them, right? Because we took a blow up, it gave a coloring only of some of the subsets. Uh, and therefore we cannot use uh, what we know about the Knesser hypergraph uh, because we don't have a coloring of all the hypergraph we only have here a coloring of some specific induced sub hypergraph of it. Well, still we could hope, and this uh, wishful thinking maybe, that maybe this induced sub hypergraph has the same chromatic number as the full hypergraph. Of course, this may happen, and if and if this is the case, then this would be okay, then this would work, and uh, and we would get the proof, and uh, and this would be indeed what we try to do in the. Uh, uh, in the third attempt, or a, uh, which is a numbered here by attempt number two, and this uh, will indeed succeed at least in proving the, uh, the uh, conjecture for some value of the parameter. So, so we want to reduce it to known results about, uh, not about general Knesser hypergraphs, but about what is called stable Knesser hypergraphs. So it gives me the opportunity to tell you something about this. Uh, there's are also some nice conjectures there. 
So we call it a K subset of the numbers from one up to N. Let me call it R stable if any two elements of this subset are at distance at least R in the cyclic order on N. We can think about placing the numbers from one up to N along the cycle. And uh, a K subset will be called R stable if the cyclic distance between any two of its elements is at least R. So in particular for R equals two, it is just a stable subset in the cycle, an independent cycle, uh, subset in the cycle. That's why it's called uh, R stable. And then the stable Knesser hypergraph, uh, so I added S here, S K G superscript R with parameters K N. This is the induced sub hypergraph of, uh, of the Knesser hypergraph, but as Vertu says, we don't take all the K subsets, we take only the R stable K subsets. Okay, so this is a. Uh, now, actually, in the constructions that we did in attempt number one, if we really take each set CI that was a, the blow up of some vertex and we place it contiguously along the cycle, so we would have a cycle of length r minus one times n, and we place each ci contiguously, as you see in the picture here, then we would get in the construction all the edges of the stable Knesser hypergraph, right? Because if you look now at the k subset, so that the cyclic distance between every two elements is at least r, then in every r minus one contiguous elements, you cannot have more than one, right? So, so definitely, all those subsets will be colored, and in fact, some more will be colored as well. And this means that if the stable Knesser hypergraph would happen to have the same chromatic number as the general Knesser hypergraph, then uh, this would be fine for us. It would give what we want. So, Noga, can I ask a quick question? Sure. So, is the stable Knesser hypergraph an induced hypergraph of the original? Yeah, uh, so it you. is an induced hypergraph on the original, but we take only vertices which are R stable. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, good. So, so as we said, if the chromatic number of this stable Knesser hypergraph would be the same as of the big Knesser hypergraph, then we would be fine. And this is not known, but in fact, this is a, a known conjecture also. So this was a, a conjecture the originally by Gunther Ziegler and le, later by, uh, uh, by Lech uh, Drinovsky, uh, Thomas Schwuchak and uh, myself. Uh, so it shows that it's never uh, too late to make a good conjecture. And, uh, and the conjecture is that the chromatic number of this uh, stable Knesser hypergraph is equal to the chromatic number of the full hypergraph. And one reason to make this conjecture is that this actually holds for the graph case, say, uh, for R equals two. This was proved by a Lex Scriver, uh, whom you see here. Uh, so really what he found was a vertex critical subgraph of the Knesser graph. In this vertex critical subgraph, the vertices were exactly all the stable here R equals two, so two stable subsets along the cycle. And, uh, and that's uh, okay. So, uh, so this is one result. Another result uh, that's actually in uh, that paper uh, with uh, uh, Lech Tunovsky and uh, Tomasz Wuchak is that uh, we showed that if the conjecture is true for R sub one and R sub two, and let's say all values of K and N, then it also holds for the product R one times R two. And therefore, if it, since we know that it holds for R equals two, it holds for any R, which is a power of two. And I want to, uh, I, I'll talk a little bit more about this, uh, uh, this proof that uh, if it's true for R1 and R2, then uh, it's true for, say, for the product. But, uh, but this basically tells us that the conjectures that I mentioned today is true for every R, which is a power of uh, two. Uh, let me just mention, and I'll not talk about it, uh, that uh, the uh, reason or the motivation uh, for that uh, result in the paper with Drunovsky and uh, Wuchak 
was to construct, and I'm only saying the buzzword, the ideas of natural numbers, which are not non-atomic, yet have the nicotine property. So this answered some questions that was say, asked in the functional analysis say, literature, and it gives some unexpected examples of ideas with what is called the positive summability property. Uh, so this is basically ideals are collections of subsets of the positive integers, so that if you have any infinite series of reals, of positive reals that diverges, then you know that there is also a member of the ideal, so that the sum of elements with indices belonging to this set in the ideal also diverges. And, uh, and we want to get some unexpected examples of this form. And for this, uh, we use uh, some property of the relevant uh, stable Knesser hypergraphs. And since I think it's uh, an interesting combinatorial property, which should have maybe other applications, let me uh, mention it. So this is a, a very short digression. It says that for every R, uh, which is at least two, and every way, what is written here, maybe I would say, uh, is some sort of hypergraph analog of the fact that there are graphs with arbitrarily large chromatic number with fractional chromatic numbers that is uh, arbitrarily close to two. But this holds in a strong sense, uh, in the following strong sense. So for every R and every small epsilon and every large C, there exists some stable place or R uniform hypergraph, you have to choose the parameters right. So this, the chromatic number is very big, it's bigger than C. And it satisfies the following, whenever you have a weight function on the vertices, and whenever you take some S between one and R, there is always a subset of the vertices that contains at most S vertices of any edge. And yet it contains almost S over R of the total weight. So even if you just think about it when the weights are zero, one, it just says that this is a hypergraph, let's say 10 uniform hypergraph, that whenever you give me a set of vertices of it, I can choose almost 30% of it that will not contain more than three vertices of each edge. So if I choose 30%, then by some simple probabilistic argument, it's easy to see that always there will be an edge that uh, contains a, uh, more than a three vertices, but, uh, but we say that we will be able to choose a almost 30%, so 29.99. And still, the simple way to do it would be to take an R-uniform R-partite hypergraph. But here, this is very far from being such, uh, namely the chromatic number is very big. So, uh, uh, so this is just to say maybe that the, these hypergraphs have interesting uh, properties that uh, may be useful. Uh, and let me also uh, mention that this, uh, uh, conjecture of uh, uh, Gunther Ziegler uh, that uh, we re-suggested uh, uh, is open for every R, which is not a power two, but the weaker result of Florian uh, Freak uh, about this conjecture suffices to prove the conjectures that I want here for every prime number R. But, uh, but this is about uh, uh, the conjectures that I'm talking about uh, today. So it means the conjecture that I'm talking about today is true for R, which is any power of two, and for every R, which is prime. Unfor unfortunately, here, there is no argument that shows that if it is true for R1 and R2, it is true for the product. Okay. Now, I wanted to say quickly uh, something about the argument that if the uh, conjecture about a, a stable Knesser hypergraphs holds for R1 and R2. It also holds for R, which is a, uh, R1 times R2, uh, because there is something uh, kind of, so it's a simple argument, but there is something magic in it, and they uh, want to try to tell you about it. Uh, so suppose we have a T coloring of the R, and R is R1 times R2, stable K subsets of N, 
Then we I also have a picture of an example. We define k1 to be t minus 1 r1 minus 1 plus k times r1. That's the value that we need if we are talking about the r1 uniform case. And we define a t coloring of the r2 stable k1 subsets of n as follows. Whenever we have an r1 stable k subset of f, which in itself is r2 stable, then uh, by the result uh, for r1, we would have a, a r1 pairwise joint k subsets of e of some color j. And then this is the color we would give this f. So it's something simple, but I realize uh, it would be hard to follow, but I have a picture here. And, uh, and then here is this magic arithmetic thing that uh, if n is at least t minus one times r1 r2 minus one plus k r1 r2, which is the value that we have when r is r1 times r2, then this is exactly t minus one times r2 minus one plus k1 that I define times r2, which is the value that is written here. So this is just some sort of coincidence that the values work like this, that this equality holds. And because of this, say, we can apply now the result for R2 to get R2 pairwise joint R2 stable K1 subsets of the same color. And each of them contains R1. And this will give us what we want. And I realize that uh, it's probably hard to follow in a, uh, with such a quick uh, uh, discussion, but, but let me show you a picture that may be a, so this is an example, uh, T is equal to R1, which is equal to R2, which is equal to K, which is two, and therefore R1 times R2 is four, and therefore K1, which is T minus one times R1 minus one plus KR1 is five, and N is 11 here. So we have here a cycle of a length 11, this is N, and we first, uh, and we really color here the pairs, right? So uh, K is two. So we have a coloring of the pairs, but we want to use it to define the coloring of the sets of size five. So we take a set of size five, this is K1, which is a, a two wise uh, stable. So two stable, you see the distance between every two elements of this set is at least two. And this set, because of the result for five, would have some two, two stable subsets of it that are disjoint. Okay, so this happens for this set. And the thing is that if a subset of this red set is two stable, then actually in the whole thing, it is four stable because the distance between it is two distances between red elements, but the distance between every two consecutive is, uh, uh, is two. So that gives us four. So every two stable set inside the red part is four stable inside the uh, whole cycle. And we would get two disjoint such sets inside each of the two disjoint sets of size five, and this will give us the four that we want. Okay, so hopefully this gives a, you the flavor of things, and, uh, uh, and that's uh, uh, the uh, only thing I wanted to say about proofs, uh, but, uh, but I still want to use a few minutes to, uh, uh, to tell you something about uh, remarks and problems, uh, mainly about uh, uh, one of them. So, so the uh, main problem is kind of the obvious. Uh, and this is if the conjecture holds for all admissible values of the parameters, we said that we know that it holds for every R, which is a power of two or prime. And therefore I view it as a strong evidence that probably it's true for all values of the parameters. It is uh, also easy to see that it holds when R is bigger than k. And I wrote the reason here, but no, uh, uh, no reason to, to really uh, read it. 
So, so it is also true uh, for R, which is bigger than uh, K. If we want to think about the counterexamples, then we uh, have to choose an R which is not prime and not the power of two. So the smallest R would be six. And, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, K would have to be even uh, at least six, right? Because of uh, for a counterexample. So, so it would have to be a pretty big example. And, uh, and therefore, even if we want to try to search uh, it will probably be a too big uh, problem uh, for uh, in terms of the parameters, but uh, uh, but anyway, I believe that is true. I want to uh, talk a little bit about a, uh, a kind of closely related problem that uh, uh, we discussed with uh, uh, Ryan uh, Elwise, uh, whom you uh, you see here. So so he's a student in uh, Princeton, and uh, and this is the following. Uh, so suppose now v is a linear space uh, over the uh, uh, field with two elements over the binary field. So it's a linear space of dimension n of vectors of length n. Maybe the vectors are longer. They are binary vectors. And we look at the family of all two to the m minus one subsets of, uh, of n whose characteristic vectors are the non-zero members of this set. Uh, linear subspace, okay? So now these are not sets of the same uniformity. Different sets have different cardinalities, but it's still a collection of sets. And what we want to ask is uh, if this F can be partitioned into little o of M, so think now about M as a big number, three wise intersecting families. So that kind of corresponds to a something like the case r equals three that I discussed before. Uh, the previous conjecture is true for r equals three because uh, three is a prime. So this is a question. Uh, now I want to say why uh, this question uh, is a, uh, a, or what we know about it and why, uh, uh, why we think it's interesting. So, uh, so by what I told you by the uh, main conjecture, uh, the fact that it holds for r equals three because uh, three is a prime, and by some linear algebra uh, argument, uh, uh, the answer is uh, no if n is not very much bigger than n. If n is at most three minus epsilon, like 2.999 m, then always, you need at least uh, some constant uh, m number of families if you want uh, them to be a uh, three was intersecting. Now, if the answer is no for every such v with n which is bigger, so you can take n as big as you want, but let me write, for example, if n is 20 m. So if the answer is no, then in any coloring of the elements of the, then it can be shown, there is some probabilistic argument that uh, in any coloring of the elements of the group, F2 to them, so just uh, uh, the elementary abelian two group, by little o of m colors, there is a monochromatic solution to the equation x plus y equals c. And this is really a, an old problem of sure for the group F2 to ZM, so maybe he was more interested in the group ZN, but, uh, but that would be very nice. So this, if the answer is no. On the other hand, if the answer is yes, it will be even uh, better. So if the answer is yes for some such V in some N, now I don't care how big is N. So you just have some linear space of dimension M, and you look at all the two to the M minus one subsets uh, corresponding to non-zero vectors, and uh, you can color them by, uh, uh, by little o of m uh, three-wise intersecting uh, uh, families, uh, then the t colors Ramsey number r three three three, which is a, a t times three, which is the largest uh, size of a complete graph in which you can color the edges by t colors with no monochromatic triangle, this would uh, grow more, be more than exponential in t. 
And this is equivalent to a question in information theory uh, that again, I just say the buzzword, that the Shannon capacity of a graph with independence number two, uh, the question is if, can, if it can be arbitrarily large. So if the answer is yes, uh, it would follow that it can be bigger than any constant we wish. Okay, so, uh, so I'm not showing uh, any of, uh, of these things, but, uh, but this says that uh, a good uh, property of this uh, question is that uh, uh, if the answer is yes, it will be interesting, and if the answer is no, it will be interesting. Uh, In your opinion, uh, what's more likely to be the answer? Uh, yeah, I think so. My belief uh, kind of changes uh, between different days, but uh, but I think that I believe yes more than I believe uh, no. And uh, maybe, uh, and I wrote here uh, that uh, there are some non-trivial coloring. So the trivial coloring is to just take all the uh, sets that have one in the first coordinate, all the sets that have one in the second coordinate, and so on, this will be intersecting, and this will give us M colors, but we can do with less colors uh, because something called the Klebsch graph is really a, a Cayley graph uh, of Z2 to the four, and there is some product construction that one, one can use here. So it just says that there are some non-trivial things that, uh, that can be done, but, uh, but again, we uh, don't know. And I think I'm pretty close to 48 uh, uh, minutes. So uh, let me uh, finish here and uh, uh, thank you uh, for participating. And please unmute yourself and thank Noga. <laughs> we have two minutes for official questions. And after that, Robert will stop recording and people are welcome to stay for unofficial questions. Right. Yeah, I, I stay as long as uh, as long as people will stay. Yeah, of course. So, so can I ask a question, Noga? Sure. So, if the conjecture is not true for all values of the parameter, are you aware of any statements or consequences that it imply which you suspect is too good to be true? Uh, no, not really. So I think, I mean, it implies a, a kind of a natural generalization, maybe, of, a, of the original Knesser conjecture. And the Knesser conjecture has lots of a, interesting applications that are kind of a, a surprising sometimes, but a, a, this would have maybe similar ones, but a, but I think none of them is not uh, too good to be true. If you are not uh, going to ask a question, please mute yourself because otherwise we'll have all this uh, noise. But if you want to ask them, uh, uh, then do unmute. And I see also that I have a, uh, okay. Uh, Can I ask you a question? Uh-huh, yes. sure. Uh, the definition of the hypergraph that you gave generalized by Sarkaria and also Ziegler to uh, say you get R subsets that are S-wise uh, intersecting, for example, instead of all right. of them being intersecting, or they have even a vector of S1 to up to Sn. And they all have a conjectural lower bound for the uh, chromatic number of these hypergraphs. I think uh, Ziegler in his paper uh, he claimed that he has proved your conjecture for all numbers, but there was an error that later on he wrote an uh, uh, erratum um, that said that uh, the, the induction proof was wrong and I only proved it for powers of primes. So I believe in Ziegler's paper, it was proof for powers of primes that your conjecture is true. And later you mean, on, uh, you mean the original, the, like his conjecture and the conjecture? The conjecture that you said, even for S wise, uh, pairwise, this. Uh, this, okay. this joint. So they, um, I mean, of, of course, the lower bound is different, but it's something similar that you have to replace R with in some place. Okay. So I know that there are many, there are many variants of a, of this, and they, uh, in some have been proved, but uh, uh, but I thought uh, I mean this 
papers that, uh, of, uh, of freaks that I looked at. Uh, I, I'm not sure, by the way, uh, whom am I talking with, because I don't see all of you, but uh, maybe you can... Uh, My write. name is Amir Jafari, and I'm from ah, Iran. Okay. okay, good, 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 yeah. So I, uh, uh, right. So, uh, so I, uh, I, I know that there have been uh, uh, lots of uh, variants and extensions, but, uh, uh, but the last paper I looked at uh, by Freak is from uh, 2020, and I don't believe you're talking about uh, something more, uh, uh, more recent, and he's not mentioning any case of, uh, of, this conje of the original conjecture that is known besides for powers of two. Right, uh, because I, I mean, there are some results that are known if you don't want R stable, but you want a little bit less stable. You want that, uh, that maybe- No, no, I, I mean, without the stability con the condition, like you have uh, R subset- Wait a second, this ends the formal part of the talk. Robert, please stop recording, but people are very welcome to stay. Thank you. Okay, sure, thanks. Uh, 